Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Ms. Geetu Singh, Assistant Professor of Law from Sri Ramsvarup Memorial University, Lucknow. Today I would be discussing on the topic Organized Crime, Prevention and Control. The learning outcome of this module is to make the learners understand causes of organized crime, to make the learners acquainted with the international obligations of prevention and control of organized crime, to make the learners understand the national laws for the prevention and control of organized crime. To begin with, organized crime is a phenomenon which has become a worldwide threat. The questions of relevance with regard to organized crime is its description. The varied description of organized crime is one of the major problems being faced by various countries in the world. The absence of an exact definition of organized crimes make it difficult for investigative authorities to trace out organized crime. The other difficulties which cannot be un or underestimated is the link between organized crime group and legal enterprises. A major cause of internationalized organized crime is the worldwide internationalization of trade and development in the area of transport, transport information and communication technologies and market development. Both in the global and the national level, a collaborative and consensual process for prevention of control of organized crime is required. As the power and process to deal with organized crime differs from country to country. The nature and extent of obligation under international law. The main purpose of international criminal law is to promote indirect crime prevention at the national level. There are a number of suppression conventions such as Drug Trafficking Convention 1988, Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Transport, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property 1970, etc., which obliges states to prohibit such crimes. Similarly, the Organized Crime Convention, the Convention and its Protocol obliges states to criminalize various conducts related to organized crime. The difference between all other suppressing conventions and the organized crime convention is that organized crime convention is not subject specific, thus enabling the application of to prosecute and punish variety of criminal activities with the only exception that it is committed by a criminal group as defined under the convention. The statement of purpose of the convention is to prevent comb and combat transnational organized crime more effectively. One of the main, main features of this convention is that in addition to the obligation of the states to prohibit, organi prohibit organized crime, it provides under Article 5.1a, the states must criminalize agreements to commit a serious crime for financial and material benefit. In other words, it obliges the state to prohibit conspiracy or participation in the organized crime group. Article 5.1b obligates the state parties to criminalize different forms of the secondary participation in the commission of a serious crime by an organized criminal group, namely organizing, direct, directing, aiding, aiding abetting, facilitating and counseling. Article 5 of the convention is a multivariated attempt to deal with the problem of organized crime, keeping in consideration the different legal traditions. The convention has provided the states with the discretion to frame laws for the prevention and control of organized crime in a manner consistent with the principles of sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states. In furtherance to Article, in furtherance to article 6 of the convention states that are under obligations to prohibit other acts associated with organized crime, specifically intentional money laundering. In pursuance to stop or prevent the commission of money laundering, Article 7 of the Convention obliges the state to institute a regulatory and supervisory mechanism over financial institution to deter, detect and monitor the flow of money and cash beyond national borders. Article 12 and 13 of the Convention further strengthens the provision of the money laundering by obliging the state parties to incorporate within their legislation stringent prohibit provisions relating to freezing, confiscating and seizure of criminal proceeds 
and assets as well as facilitating of international cooperation for these purposes. Article 14 of the Convention further allows the state parties to dispose of the proceeds of the crime in accordance to the with the domestic legislation. For example, such proceeds can be used to compensate the victims invested, invested in new technologies or provide assistance to state lacking means to prevent organized crime, etc. Along with the prevention of money laundering, the provision of the convention also provides obligation to the states for prevention of crime of corruption and obstruction of justice under Article 8 and 23 respectively. Article 19 of the convention has left on to the state parties to adopt measures for the prevention, detection and punishment of corruption in accordance with their respective Lex Lossi. The convention lacks in, in not providing specific guidelines on the measures to be adopted to track, tackle the root causes of corruption and other related factors responsible for the growth of corruption. Article 23 further obliges the state to criminalize the use or threat of force or intimidation or giving undue advantage to induce false testimony or interfere with the production of evidence or the official duties of judicial or law enforcement authorities. The UN Corruption Convention addresses some of the major issues and obliges the state to take effective anti-corruption measures. Article 24 of the Convention obliges the state parties to cooperate closely with one another to enhance to establish channels of communication between the competent authorities, agencies and services, to cooperate with other state parties in conducting inquiries, to provide necessary items or quantities of substance for analytical or investigating purposes, to facilitate effective coordination between their competent authorities, agencies and services and to promote the exchange of personals and other experts, including subject to bilateral agreements or arrangements between the state parties, to exchange information with other state parties on specific means and methods used by organized crime groups. Article 24 subclause 2 of the convention provides that the states may enter into bilateral or multilateral agreements or arrangements to foster such cooperation and coordination. Article 31 of the convention obliges the state to take endeavors to develop and evaluate national projects and to establish and promote best practices and policies aimed at the prevention of transnational organized crime and to reduce existing or future opportunities for organized crime criminal groups to participate in lawful mar markets with proceeds of crime through appropriate legislative, administrative or other measures. For better enforcement, this convention is supplemented by three protocols with provisions to deal with organized crime like trafficking in persons, smuggling and aid offenses relating to firearms and ammunitions. Apart from the transnational criminal law, other branches of international law like the International Criminal Law ICL, and International Humanitarian Law also obligates the state parties to prohibit organized crime. Indian Legislative Measures for the Protection and Control of Organized Crime A large number of countries around the world are now confronted with the problem of prevention and control of transnational organized crime. The major forms of organized crime prevalent in contemporary times are as follows. Illicit drug trafficking, alien smuggling, money laundering, financial fraud, counterfeiting, illegal arms trafficking, illegal human trafficking and prostitution. India has not escaped the vices of organized crime. Criminal groups have been operating in India since ancient times. One of the major drawbacks in India for prevention and control of organized crime is that India does not have a central legislation for curbing organized crime. There are a number of states like Maharashtra, Karnataka and Gujarat which have their own laws for dealing with the offenses of organized crime. In India, there are different laws having provisions which is and may be applied in cases of wrongs under organized crime. For example, the Indian Penal Code 1860, a substantive law has provisions prescribing punishment for organized crime offenses such as conspiracy, kidnapping for ransom, 
counterfeiting of coins. There are other laws like Customs Act 1962, the Narcotic and Psychotropic Substance Act 1988, the Immigration Act 1983, the Excise Act 1950, the Arms Act 1959, the Explosive Act 1884, the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1956, the Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999, and the Public Gambling Act 1867. The major drawbacks in dealing with the organized crime in India is that the law is scattered in various provisions of different statutes. National legislative provisions for the prevention and control of different types of organized crime. According to the nature and characteristics of the society, countries have enacted their own laws to deal with the organized crime. Prevention of drug trafficking in India is a law which is dealing with the protection of organized crime. In exercise of its lawmaking power for implementation of any international treaty agreement or decision made in the international level the indian parliament enacted to prevent and control the practice of illegal trafficking the narcotic drugs and psychopathic substance act 1985 here and after called as the ndps act The NDPS Act provides power to the central government to take measures for preventing and combating abuse of and eliciting traffic in narcotic drugs. Section 15 to 32 of the NDPS Act provides for punishment relating to violation of the law which ranges from 6 months to 20 years the depending on the gra- gra- gravity of the offence committed the NDPS Act has further provided provisions for constitution of national fund in order to control drug abuse licensing over chemical substance which can be used in the manufacturing of narcotic drugs and psychopathic substance banning totally total suspension remission or commutation of sentence under the penal provisions for feature of all illegally acquired properties derived from or attributable to illicit trafficking etc for the pre- prevention and control of drug trafficking in india the narcotic central bureau which is the national drug control agency is established to prevent and combat the use of narcotic drugs and psychopathic substance another law that is the prevention of illicit trafficking of narcotic drugs and psychopathic substance act 1988 enacted by the parliament it is this act the prevention of smuggling in india the conservation of foreign exchange and prevention of smuggling activities act 1974 coffee posa was enacted by the indian parliament to provide preventive detention and to protect the guidelines of foreign exchange Another objective of this act is to control smuggling activities and other issues in relation to these activities. Section 3 of Coffee Posa confers power on the central and the state governments to issue orders for detaining a person if it is established that the person has acted detrimental to the protection and intensification of foreign exchange. The Smugglers and Foreign Exchange Manipulators Act 1976 is another act whose purpose is to forfeit illegally acquired properties of the smugglers and foreign exchange manipulators under the provision of this act property can be forfeited merely on the ground that the person possessing these properties was detained under coffee posa prevention of illegal firearms trafficking in india In pursuant to the prevention of illicit trafficking of firearms the provisions of the Arms Act and the Arms Rule governing the export and import of small arms have been made very stringent Section 10 of the Arms Act 1959 requires that anyone intending to engage in export import of arms should first acquire requisite license Similarly import of arms by individuals or commercial entities is permitted only against a license Prevention of illegal human trafficking in India As per article 3 para A of the protocol to prevent suppress and punish trafficking in person trafficking is any activity leading to recruitment transportation harboring or receipt of person by means of threat or use of force or a position of vulnerability India is signatory to a number of conventions on the production of trafficking and forced labor for example the forced labor convention of the international of the international labor organization 1930 convention for the suppression of the traffic in person and of the exploitation of prostitution of 
others 1949 supplementary convention on the abolition of slavery slave trade and institution and practices similar to slavery 1956 the international covenant on for civil and political rights 1966 the international covenant for economic social and cultural right 1966 the convention on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women 1979 the convention on the rights of child of the child 1989 etc in pursuance to the international obligation of the protection of child right women right and prevention of trafficking in human being india has special provisions on in, in the indian constitution 1950 the indian penal code 1860 and the immoral traffic prevention act 1956 The various provisions of Indian Penal Code 1860 related to the trafficking in humans is as follows. The 2013 the Criminal Law Amendment Act has amended various sections of the Indian Penal Code including provisions on the human trafficking in India. The Amendment Act has defined human trafficking under section 370 of the Indian Penal Code to bring it at par with the UN Trafficking Protocol. Though these steps were taken to maintain the international standard, yet there are certain gaps that remain between Indian law and the UN Trafficking Protocol. Firstly, Indian legislations fail to recognize and penalize all forms of labor trafficking as required by the UN Trafficking Protocol. Secondly, India's law including the Amendment Act have not provided very effective system for the safety recovery and compensation for the victims of human trafficking victims as is required by the UN Trafficking Protocol. The Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act 1956 is a legislation for the prohibiting and controlling trafficking in human being one of the essential features of the itpa is that the that under section 8 it allows for arrest of person who are engaged in acts of prostitution section 5 of this act declares the procuring inducing or taking persons for the sale of prostitution as a punishable offense section 6 declares obtaining a person in a premise where prostitution is carried out to be an offense under this act several rehabilitative initiative is also prescribed under this act such as setting up of protective homes appointment of special police officers assisted by women police officers to investigate trafficking offenses and setting up of special courts in case of trafficking of human beings the law enforcement can be made aware and take action in two different ways both the judicial magistrate and the executive magistrate may order rescue and subsequent investigation a magistrate on information received from any sources including police officer ngo civilians and government employees may take up such rescue operations and subsequent investigations it also empowers the special police officers to search without warrant and carry out rescue operation the judicial process for the trafficking case is divided into five steps that is rescue investigation inquiry trial post conviction Apart from the ITPA there are other central and state laws which deals with the prevention and control of human trafficking in India such as the Bonded Labour Abolition Act 1976 the Child Labour Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986 the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989 etc Transplantation of Human Organ Act 1994 the Juvenile Justice Act 2000 Immigration Carriers Liability Act 2000 the prohibition of child marriage act 2006 maharashtra control of organized crime act 1999 and the goa children's act 2013 etc money laundering prevention preventive laws in india the process of transforming the proceeds of crime into apparently legitimate money or other aspects in is known as money laundering the interpol has defined money laundering as any act or attempt act to conceal or disguise the identity of illegally obtained proceed so that they appear to have originated from legitimate sources the major political and social effect of money laundering is if left unchecked the organized criminals can infiltrate financial institution acquire control of large sectors of the economy through investment or even other bribes to public officials and indeed governments for their benefit thereby affecting the social fabric collective ethical standard and the ulti and ultimately the democratic institution of the society
the Indian Parliament has enacted the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Section 2U Money Laundering Act provides that an offence of money laundering is committed when a person in any ways deals with the proceeds of crime. Section 4 of the Money Laundering Act prescribes punishment of rigorous punishment of rigorous imprisonment of not less than three years which may extend to seven years which may with fine which may extend to five lakh for offenses of money laundering the proviso to section 4 further adds that for the offenses under para 2 of part a the punishment may extend to 10 years chapter 3 of the act provides detailed provisions relating to attachment adjudication and confiscation and confiscation of matters and properties involved in the offense of money laundering property involved in the offense of money laundering is attached and confiscated under the act an official not below the rank of deputy director can order attachment of proceeds of crime for a period of 180 days after informing the magistrate thereafter he will send a report containing material information relating to such attachment to adjudicating authority Section 8 deals with the procedure of adjudication. After the official forwards the report to the adjudicating authority, this authority should send a so-called notice to concerned person within 30 days. After considering the responses and all related information, the authority can give finality of the order of attachment and make a confiscation order, which will thereafter be confined or rejected by the special court. The Act also provides provisions relating to the obligation of banking companies, financial institutions and intermediaries in lieu of prevention and control of money laundering. The Reserve Bank of India has advised the bank to use certain customer identification methods for opening of accounts and monitoring transactions of suspicious, suspicious natures for the purpose of reporting it to the authority, such as the Know Your Customer form. Money laundering is standards combating of an money and money laundering standards combating of financing of terrorism obligation of banks the nodal agency in india for anti money laundering is the financial intelligence unit prevention of terrorism in india terrorism is one of the most important issue of concern in the international scenario Conceptual, conceptually, terrorism does not come within the ambit of organized crime, as the main aim and objective of terrorists is either to create pressure politically or they create terror because of ideological difference. There is no financial gain through terrorism. However, the Indian experience confirms that behind the veil of terrorism, the criminals are nowadays perpetrating different kinds of crimes such as killing, rape, kidnapping, gun running and drag, drug trafficking. To prevent terrorism and pursuant to the threat of national security, the Indian government had enacted an anti-terrorist law that is the Terrorist and Disruptive Activity Prevention Act 1985 which has been repealed and the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002. At present there is no law in India for the prevention of terrorism per se but few laws such as the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967 by the Unlawful Activity Prevention Amendment Act 2004 and the National Security Act 1980 are used in matters relating to terrorism. The National Security Act 1980 empowers the union government or the state government to detain a person to prevent him from acting in any manner prejudicial to the defense of India. The relation of India with foreign powers or the security of India or with respect to any foreigners with a view to regulate his continued presence in India. Preventive detention can also be made under this act. The Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967 defines a terrorist act and also defines a terrorist organization as an organization listed in the schedule or an organization operating under the same name as an organization so listed. It further provides a mechanism for forfeiture of proceeds of terrorism apart from providing stringent punishments for terrorism related offenses. This act empowers the central government to declare any association that engages in activities that support any secessionist claim or disclaims questions 
disrupts the sovereignty and territorial integrity of India. Once an association is declared unlawful, the government has broad powers to resist its restrict its activities and criminalize individual involvement with such association. The Armed Forces Special Power Act 1958 is more draconian as it allows the government to define as its discretion and without judicial review an area as disturbed and empower the military to school to kill. Problems in combating organized crime. First, absence of a special law controlling and suppressing organized crime inadequate laws to target criminal groups they are more affecting in imposing individual liability complex nature of organized crime make the procedural laws ineffective difficulty in obtaining proof because of transnational character of organized crime lengthy trials and rate of convictions generally low because of corruption and political and bureaucratic nexus there is accurate lack of resources and training for the investigating agencies officers and experts to control transnational organized crime it is essential that there is effective coordination in national and international level which is often lacking the transnational nature of organized crime brings with it the difficulty of dual criminality as different nations have different laws to deal with such crimes suggestions to control and prevent organized crimes a special comprehensive legislation be enacted by the parliament to deal exclusively with organized crime the new legislations with adequate and effective provisions defining the offense of organized crime detailed procedure for investigation inquiry prosecution trial and rehabilitation and witness protection a detailed provision for punishment for the commission as well as attempt of organized crime special courts should be established for trying such cases Special training programs and workshops for authorized officers and agencies should be conducted. Criminal laws should be strengthened and specialized limits should be units should be made. Strong political commitment should be there. Legislative action and strengthening of criminal justice system and building up of strong public opinion against it has to be there. There has to be proper coordination and cooperation between nation state to prevent and control organized crime. by formulating treaties to conclude it can be said that it should be borne in mind that organized crime is first a domestic problem and when left unchecked or un or on failure to control it it takes up the transnational character the first and most important step toward controlling organized crime is to keep the occurrence of crime within the nation in bounds it only then can be able to control and prevent the occurrence of organized crime thank you